I think it's recording. I can't. Oh, there it is. Okay, it's recording. Um, I want to record it so I can save this to YouTube afterwards. All right. So, um, uh, I want I want by the end of this talk you to have the you know just just feel like you can you know what you're looking for in a new hire or at least you can come up with a process in order to determine what you're looking for in a new hire. Um, then I want you to be able to uh, know how to create a code challenge that's fun and informative to the team so that you know you know you could run somebody through it and by the end of it know is this somebody who I want to work with. And then actually run somebody through that technical code challenge that you've written. Uh, so that way you, you can actually get that inf information out of it. So uh, before we get started, we act, the, um, there was a uh, talk at the React uh, Denver meetup. Uh, I think it was this last Monday or one week before that. I can't remember. But there was an actual talk about uh, being the interviewee um, and side. And so this, uh, I didn't plan it out with them, but it's sort of like a, a sibling talk to that, um, which this being on, we're on the other side of the desk. So if you haven't seen this, highly recommended to go get it. Obviously there's a link in the slides, which you now all have. All right, so let's, let's talk about what are we really looking for in a hire? Because I've seen a lot of places uh, just sort of begin to hire because they vaguely, they know we need to hire somebody. Our team is too small or somebody just left our team. And you know, we're, we're too slow and management wants us to move faster. Well, it, it's really easy to fall into a trap of saying, okay, we need to hire and then just start going out and, and then look, you know, interviewing people. But if we, we need to know exactly why we're hiring. Are we hiring because a very specific skill is missing? Or are we hiring because, you know, one, um, we just need more people to work on tickets? You know, that, that will really sort of change exactly what we're looking for. Uh, so th there's these two general ideas, which we have a very specific problem. And when I talk about specific problem, I don't mean like, hey, we're, we, we have a team that's sort of okay with, with everything, but we're a little bit light on DevOps. Maybe we should get somebody who's a developer, but also knows a little bit of DevOps. I'm more talking about, we really need somebody very specific that's like deep dive into DevOps. Like for example, uh, Kim's company, you do, um, uh, she mentioned that she did do uh, Kubernetes. Like somebody who's like, I knew Kubernetes like extremely well and that's all I do. That would be a specific problem. Uh, a general problem would be, okay, we have, um, we have tons of things to do, but we don't have the actual um, number of people that can work on them. But we also want people to can work on, across our entire stack of things you know, a full stack developer, or if you're like in front end only, somebody who can, you know, has the range of all the front end technologies that your team uses. My, um, uh, my suggestion is that we rarely actually truly need uh, specialists. We, we often more need the, the generalists. And so if we do need a specialist, that's where I recommend we actually hire a company, a consulting company to take care of that need for us. And as part of those fees, we could have them teach our existing developers how those systems operate so that by the time we're done with that contract, um, we have a system in place, we know how to operate it, and our developers you know, have, have those skills now. Um, what I'm thinking we really truly need is a group of developers who can work as part of a team. And together, they're going to end up being, um, be able to create way, way, way more than you'd ever be able to, you know, do as just like a group of specialists that only do like the one thing, you know, just like the, just like the, uh, uh, the graphic that I have here. We, we need teamwork. It makes the dream work. 
All right, so we, we know what we need. You know, may, uh, we, we know who we want. We don't know exactly who they want, but now we need to create a code challenge that's gonna be fun and informative for them. So um, the first thing is to recognize that everyone coming in to the, on the other side of the table is gonna be extremely nervous like way, way, way more nervous than like under normal circumstances. And especially if we're hiring now during a pandemic, they're gonna be even more nervous on top of that. So this is something to keep in mind when designing our challenge um, and, and also like interacting with them on the time of the, the interview. And th this is something that I've actually seen is people complain about uh, the interview process of like, oh man, I go in and they just make me whiteboard, um, I don't know, depth for a search or like the end queens problem or some other, you know, really not that easy uh, and not that really truly informative whiteboarding code challenges. Um, but then when it comes their turn to, to be the interviewer, they're like, well, I don't know what to do. Well, how was I interviewed? And I got this job and I'm awesome, so therefore I probably should just do exactly what they did for me. And that's how we end up getting the same interview process over and over and over again, even when we have been put in, in charge of that interview process. Um, and so I know that there's quite a few of us who are changing things and trying to be better, um, but there's also some of us who, who you know, we're, we get as nervous and as scared when creating the interviews and interviewing as sometimes the people being interviewed. So let's not allow history to repeat itself and create a, uh, I don't know, an interview that is subpar. So um, I came up with this, this idea the, the other day while I was making this talk, because I've, I've actually created this code challenge I'm gonna show you later but I, um, I hadn't really thought about it in this specific terms. But I want us all to think of the code challenge, like the technical part of the interview. Let's think of it like a Dungeons and Dragons session. Um, now, I know not all of you will like sort of know what that is, um, or I, I don't know, may, maybe you all do, um, but let, let's assume um, that, that some of us at least don't. Um, Dungeons and Dragons is a role-playing game. Um, it's mostly done in just like with a, several different people in the group and you use your imagination and then you solve problems essentially. Now there's a bunch of combat and like shooting orcs with arrows and magic and all that stuff. But if you take that away, it's a game, it's a collaborative game where you're working together to solve problems. And that's what I want to, to see this code challenge as. It's a game that we are um, opening our interviewees into and releasing them into this world that we've created, with that world being the code challenge itself. And our job isn't to force them down a very specific path, but rather to see where they, um, where they go and, and understand how their minds work um, and, and just like let them be free. Um, so, uh, we, we want to make sure that we don't fall flat in our faces here. Uh, one, we, we could like get really excited and start building this code challenge and like having evil ma maniacal, ma maniacal, maniacal laughter while we're doing it because it can be fun to write these code challenges. But before we write any lines of code, we ourselves have something that's much more important to do first. We need to create a rubric. We need to know what exactly we're going to be judging our players, these interviewers, interviewees on. So for example, we might have a rubric saying, okay, um, uh, this interviewee was willing to ask for help when they got stuck. Or how did they take feedback? Um, 
the, the rubric can be anything, but what's really most important is that the rubric stays consistent across everyone you interview. It's also really important before you start interviewing that you have a baseline and say, okay, we're looking for some, somebody who matches all of these. Put your company's culture or the culture you, you want in the rubric. And also like, because culture ad is a really important thing and it can be really hard for us to sort of imagine what like a new culture element could possibly be. Uh, you, you could have areas for, hey, they like, they did this other thing which we didn't even think about and it's really awesome and we'd love to have that on the team. That's something to discuss alongside the rubric um, after the entire interview process. But anyways, the rubric is super, super, super important. All right, um, so I want to uh, go down and uh, actually show you the codes. So let's go into the, the dungeon entrance. And then I realized I didn't actually load up, load up my, um, uh, the code here. So let's go to my GitHub. And here it is, interview challenge. Um, so I'm, I created this URL shortener. This is an actual code challenge that I wrote way back when I was working at Apto um, over a year ago now. I, I, yeah, over a year ago. And uh, in this code challenge, um, I ran it and I, it was really interesting because I had never expected this reaction, but I had interviewees tell, tell, give feedback that this was the favorite part of the entire interview process, which I had never seen before. Um, so I want to show, show this off to you. So the, uh, if we go back to the beginning, I have the README here. What, what I do is introduce this entire uh, project to the team, or to the, the interviewee, and tell them that we're, we're a junior programmer. And I, I tell them like, hey, we're gonna role play this. We're a junior developer, somebody else was tasked this, they started working on it. Unfortunately, they, you know, then, you know, they got transferred to another team, they took vacation. It's a great time to like, like put in a little bit of uh, culture about like how we have really good vacation policies um, or anything else. Uh, and they're no longer available to work on it. And it's our job to now work together with that. So uh, prime them that this is a pair programming exercise. You're going to work together and that, that you are essentially are going to take the role of a junior developer. And so if you're looking for a junior developer, then you're looking for somebody who can collaborate together with a junior and sort of figure things out. If you're looking for a mid or a senior, uh, I would highly recommend that you're also looking for mentorship ability. Can this person sort of go through, help out with the programming, do the things technically, but also help someone who is, you know, junior running through this code challenge. Um, to that end, I show this uh, code challenge as being partially created. Uh, can you see the, um, the sort of faint check marks that I have here? Yes. Yep. Yeah, so the idea is that this is, a, this is sort of like, this is the game world. Um, it's, a, it's a working, it's like not a working app, but it's also not just a bunch of challenges that are sitting there. Um, and it's not like fully tested either. Uh, as I said, it's, it's sort of like a dungeon that has many, many, many different paths to go through this. And I'm less interested with how a candidate like how many challenges they actually complete. Um, because we can just take a look at this and say, well, hey, uh, here's, here's the challenges. If you get exit, you know, if you check off all of these, then you win, obviously. But it's not that simple. Uh, it's a little, bit, a little bit more interesting. And I basically release the developer. Um, into this. Now I give a couple really um, baseline rules before we begin. Uh, first of all, we're using our computer. So as the interviewer, I've got this entire thing set up. If we're using the real database, which in this one, I'm not using the actual database. I'm just using an object that's stored in memory. But if we're using a real database, 
you want all that stuff locally in your own computer. That way you don't have to spend any time setting up the environment of your applicant. And also what if they didn't bring a computer? I don't want to like, you know, have them fail out of the interview simply because they didn't bring a computer. Um, the other thing is the computer, the applicant will not touch your computer. Um, you will do all the writing and everything else yourself. So this will be a, a traditional pair programming exercise where they navigate and you drive. And what that ends up looking at like is saying, hey, okay, um, like tell, tell me what, what we should do first because you're the clueless junior developer who needs help with this. And uh, you can introduce, like show them this code, obviously you'd be in your editor, and then just let them, let them go and see how do they react to a completely unfamiliar environment? Because if you hire them, they're gonna be coming into your probably complicated app that's a lot more um, unfamiliar to them. And so they might, they might ask, well, do you have any tests? Oh, sure, let's go take a look. All right, yeah, we have some tests here. Um, now in this case, I actually have all the tests and they run and they pass. But they're, they're, it's sort of like a fake testing because when, when we run the code, which runs, um, it doesn't return anything at all. What ends up happening is uh, we come into the route, let's say, and we get into URL shortener and everything just sort of, it looks right at first glance. Okay, we, we have, you know, we're, we're taking in the URL from the request that body. I'll have like Postman open in the side and you can hit Postman and send it the URL and then you just get back URL and an empty string. Well, so at this point in time, you're sort of looking for like, well, what do they wanna do? So an example that they might have, that they might um, go into is say, oh, okay, let's take a look at this database URL. Um, I wish, I wish they had the ability to like click through this in, in GitHub, but to in URL. And this begins the, the interesting technical debugging challenge. So I have like a purposeful debugs in here. They're sort of interesting traps for people who may or may not be familiar with promises. Uh, for example, the, for example, can anybody spot um, I don't know if I can do the split thing. Um, to, if I do this routes URL shortener. Do that and that. Can you see both of them or only one of the windows? Only one. Just oh, one. Only one. Okay, we'll do this. You go away, you go away, and you go away. All right, now you should be able to see both, right? Yep. All right. Can any of you tell me what the problem is, is here, the, the bug that's been inserted? Oh, John, thank you for that, that link. I'll take, it, I'll take a look at it later. Yeah, of course. Anybody see the, the bug? All right. Well, Are we passing in a long URL to the database? On line eight, instead of the short one. Um, so this this actually does work. Uh, so this is setting like the key and value, and so there there is a string in here, um, and so it does add it to the database. Uh, 
uh, the problem here is that we return, this is a promise. And so we return resolve, but over here in this side, we're just doing const short URL equals URL.save URL. And because save URL returns a promise, uh, we're not really waiting for that, even though this is synchronous code here because my database stuff is just a local, um, a, a local object that's stored in memory. Uh, what ends up happening is that this isn't a string that comes back. It's the promise object. And so when I try to send this, it ends up doing a two string on it, which ends up being just an empty string. So uh, this is where our applicant could potentially, you know, say like, oh, you know, we need to use a dot then, catch short URL in that, and then we can send it out. Or they could say, okay, let's use async await. I don't really care which way they would choose to go, but it's two different paths that can be taken. So at that point, um, then it just sort of moves into like, there, there's some more potential debugging to go on. For example, my short URL is actually a UUID, which is very, very long, um, which you know sort of breaks the, the, the point about the, the entire thing being a short URL. Um, and so that, that goes into like, oh, well then we can write, we can choose to potentially write an algorithm to come up with our own short URL or we can take the UID and make it really small. There's a lot of different options there and I allow the applicant to sort of make that choice and then they have to make an almost business type decision. Like what actually makes sense for this uh, project um, in, in, this, in this space. And something that's important for us as the, the guide, the dungeon master as it was, as it were, is we guide them through this process. If our applicant gets stuck, well, we, we're taking that role of the, the pair programmer. So um, we can give suggestions like, you know, I, I, wonder, I wonder if there's an asynchronous problem with this, or I wonder if there's like a timing issue, or I wonder what, what short URL is over here. Um, maybe we're not getting it. Maybe it's a, maybe it's an, really is an empty string. Um, and sort of like give, give the applicant some suggestions that way they don't sit there and languish in their, you know, whatever, um, wherever their mind space ends up being during that process. Now, if they reach the end of this and they're able to get through uh, all of the stories, which um, I usually have the, the, the rubric say like, okay, if you're a junior developer and you're coming in, I expect you to basically get the two debugs that I have in there and then maybe add in their return a an actual real shortened URL. Uh, as a mid-level, I would expect you maybe to get, do all of that plus, you know, do, do this user story. And as a senior developer, I might expect you to do all of them um, all of them together. Now they might go off on a tangent because I could be allowed to be convinced by a senior developer that I really need to add in some kind of, um, to like refactor the application because I just used a express generator and I didn't change anything at all. So even though we're not using any views, um, we have all the view stuff and app.js is just a mess. Plus also I've got a mixture of var and const. So all of these things, like it could be a, um, this, this could be a place where a senior developer would say, you know what, this is really important. We need to clean this up before we start adding code. And I would accept that. And I would let them sort of go through that. And so that's where, that's where I'm talking about. It's this open world that we're releasing the applicant into. Do -do. And then at the final end, if they manage to get through all the stuff, do everything, I would ask them to, hey, what's like, what is the next thing that you think should be added to this? And sort of like go, go through, you know, talk through what, what they would want to add in. Um, the entire process, the entire technical part of this, I would say should take between 30 and 45 minutes. Uh, the idea being that normally this will be an hour long slot 
and I want the ability for the introductions at the beginning and questions at the end. Where is there? Here we go. So uh, let's do a quick recap. Um, it's really, really important to understand who we're looking for uh, before we start writing our technical interview or before we even start writing the, the, the job description. Um, determining who we're going to look for helps us determine what's going to be in our rubric. And once we determine what our rubric is, then we can create our code challenge and sort of customize it towards exactly what we're going to looking, looking for. Um, I didn't mention it here, but I do like the idea of using your, your tech stack for the code challenge because that's extremely relevant to what you're doing. Now, you may use like, you know, you may use Kubernetes, let's say. I don't necessarily think that having a code challenge in like, you know, with a fully uh, scaled up application is, is that necessary unless you're hiring for somebody who that's going to be a major requirement, but that's going to be your rubric is going to, going to drive that. Um, create the code challenge that has a lot of leeway for movement in it. You want to, you want to give people that the feeling that they're actually going to be part of a team. Like that, this interview is sort of a teamwork already. And then finally, run that technical interview and, um, and, and find out, is this person somebody that you want to work, continue to work with? Both on a technical level and also like a cultural level. Um, now, I didn't mention this here, but it's super, super, super awesome if you can get another person into the room, especially if that other person isn't, you know, someone exactly like you. So for me, I'm a white bearded Denver man. If I can get a woman into the interview, so much better because I've seen a lot of guys interviews who do not like, they, they change their, like their behavior when they feel that they're, they're in the room with another woman. And I just, I like to catch that before they would get hired because that's not, not good to have that. Um, so with that, any questions? I, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as, so in your code, you have this bug involving promises, the solution being using some kind of like dot then or await. So are the bugs that you're planning in these things that you've kind of personally run into in your own kind of journey to code or are they mistakes you see junior devs making a lot? And so you want to be on the lookout for them. Um, that specific code bug, I see senior developers make all the time. It, it's a very easy uh, problem to have, especially when we start working with async await. Um, it, it just sort of becomes rote. They're like, oh yeah, I can do, I can like um, uh, create a variable and set it equal to calling a, an asynchronous function. Uh, and then you just forget to write the uh, await part and bam, there's like, why isn't anything working? Everything's broken. I don't know why. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. Brooks, what if you work at a company and you don't, you're not in a position of leadership to like design the, the interview, but you want to share this? Like what, what strategies do you recommend if you um, have limited influence on the kind of interviews that go on at your company? That's a really good question. And um, I, I, I think it, it helps to remember that most people doing the interviewing have no idea what they are doing. And, and to that end, a lot of people that are doing interviewing don't even want to do the interviewing, mostly because like, yes, it takes a lot of time out of their, their day, but also because they don't know what they're doing. They know they don't know what they're doing. And then it's also really nervous doing that in front of somebody else. There's a lot of um, uh, just sort of coming up with things on the fly that you have to do. So, volunteering to run the interview. 
is like one of the easiest ways to get your foot into that door. And it might take like, it might be one sort of hiring season that you have to go through where you don't have the choice at all with the tech interview. Sort of like wiggle your way in slowly and then you can, you can get there and eventually, and eventually get it in. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I got a question. You kind of hinted at it in, in the talk there, Brooks. Uh, but you mentioned um, why this kind of cycle continues if, if it seems like most of the tech world knows that it's kind of broken and doesn't really, really work very well or is not very effective, then, then why, why continue the same practice? I, I honestly believe that it's because, uh, and like I did this the first few times that I hired, um, is, well, okay, now I'm, now you're asking me to hire, like to interview somebody. I have no idea what to do. And I ended up Googling common interview questions. It's really funny as when we're applicants, we Google common interview questions that, you know, uh, for, for applicants, try doing like the Google from the other side and you'll get like the exact opposite. You'll get a whole bunch of blog posts and other things were like, this is the best thing to ask. You'll get like the most information by asking these four questions. And that's how you end up getting like bullshit questions. Like, tell me, what is your greatest weakness? Um, or, or something like that. And, and, and so- I suck I at answering think... shitty interview questions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Also, hey, Kyle. Um, I think that it becomes important for us to actually think about and remember what it's like when we're interviewing. In fact, if, if it's possible, if you're doing an interview and you can get like um, uh, permission from your boss, go on a fuck few interviews yourself. Like go out there and get interviewed by your competition if possible and find out what they're doing and then design a better interview than them. It's great advice, thank you. Any more questions? Uh, I sort of have a question. Um, what would you say is like is the best website for like practicing this kind of thing? Um, I've had I've heard good things from Pram. Uh, I don't remember the exact. I don't remember if there's like a T on the end of that. Um, but I've heard that that's like uh, interview and practice where you can both be the interviewer and interviewee. Um, so you can practice on both sides of the table for that. Uh, but I've never done it myself, so I can't like speak to it. I've just heard other people um, have, have done it and said that they liked it a lot. Um, I don't like, I, I, would, I would probably reach out uh, to, oh, Pramp, thank you, Leanne. Um, I would reach out to a lot of um, like co uh, peers and just say like, hey, can I give you any training interviews? Especially if there's um, there, there's students coming out of uh, code schools, um, I would ask them and say like, hey, can I give you a practice interview? I'll give you feedback and you can give me feedback. And uh, together we can just make this, uh, make this interview process that much better. Yeah, that's an awesome idea actually, thanks. Yeah. Any more questions? Going once, going twice. All right, well, that is a meetup, everyone. Thank you uh, for joining me. Hopefully this was helpful.
Um, I, I, as I said, I will have the uh, recording once it renders and Zoom gives it to me. I'll throw it up on uh, YouTube and put a link into the Meetup page uh, so you could all look at it later. Um, I have a link to the, I'll, we'll also put a link to the, um, uh, the slides that I used in there. And um, I, I think I'll just sort of hang out here until eight o'clock and then I'll probably shut the Zoom down. But um, thanks everybody for, uh, for coming out or staying in, I guess. I don't know, something. Awesome, thanks Brooke. Yeah. Thanks so much. Great job, Brooke. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brooks. Yeah, I definitely appreciate it.